This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. Kicking off the show today is Caitlin McCulloch, Director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center, with a cattle market update. Greg Hanselcheck, K-State veterinarian, continues the show with information about how to care for cows and calves in cold weather. Hypothermia is a concern for many young calves when it comes to our current weather conditions. Another segment of Faces in Agriculture rounds out today's show. Melissa Nelson with South Bend Industrial Hemp talks about the challenges the business has faced and how they are working to overcome them. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Monday show with a cattle market update. And this week, we're joined by Director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Caitlin McCulloch. Caitlin, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Shelby. Caitlin, kicking off our cattle market conversation with what is cash looking like? So the cash markets have been a little quiet. Usually the week of Christmas, you tend to see auctions not run or them not being covered by USDA AMS. So they're a little thinner coming out of those holiday weeks. In Dodge City, Kansas, we had the first two weeks, say of 2024, we saw prices of 700 to 800 pound animals in that two, you know, plus or minus $3 around 230 or so. And that's up quite a bit from where they were in mid-December. Mid-December, you saw some ranges closer to 220. So positive on that side. The five to sixes were 270 uh, last week. And that's down a little bit from the previous report, which was before Christmas uh, for that weight group of 277. So a little bit weaker on that side. We look at the fed cattle market last week ended around 174 for live FOB steers. That price has been kicking around the low 170s now for a couple of weeks and, uh, you know, doesn't seem to be looking to pick a direction quite yet. But we would expect that to maybe increase as we head a little bit further into the year, but not maybe in the short term. And what about on the futures front? The futures market has had a a rough couple of weeks. You know, we've had some really wild volatility in that market, but things have quieted down here coming into 2024. Relatively quiet day on Friday. Live cattle futures were down, you know, 20 to 30 cents in kind of the first half of the year. Maybe what the more interesting thing about the board right now is the lack of spread among the contracts. So Typically, you see a lot more seasonality at play between February and April and then April and June. And right now that spread is, you know, only two or three dollars between April and June right now. So a relatively flat board picture right now on the live cattle side. Feeder cattle were up about five cents on Friday. This market, too, has seen a lot of volatility, but they've really come back off those lows that we put in a couple of weeks ago. These are hovering around 227, 226 in the January and March contracts, and then bumping up into the 230s for the for April and May. I think once you start to see things warm up, these contracts might really take off. But until then, it might be a little bit of a waiting game because it does seem like feedlot profitability has weakened. Uh, it weakened in December and is expected to be fairly weak here in the first quarter of this year. And that's going to hamper that ability for those feeder cattle prices to move higher in any significant way. And as we're thinking about what the markets are doing, what about for the box beef cutout? So box beef dipped all the way back down to the 270s for choice. So a pretty low point in the year in December compared to what we'd seen maybe most of the year. In recent days leading up, so all of last week, we saw it build back up into the 285 range and Friday closed the negotiated choice cutout at 289. So all positive things, but I think a lot of that's related to weather. We had winter storms moving across the country late last week, which really disrupted slaughter flows, both the ability to get cattle to slaughter plants, as well as the ability to get meat out of out of Packers' hands into the rest of the supply chain. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that cut out fade a little bit more in the next couple of weeks. But seasonally, we tend to see this little bit of dip here in January, maybe even into February, and then things should start to pick back up and move a little bit higher. And Caitlin, wanting to talk with producers about the 50% trimming. 
wholesale 50% fresh lean trimmings have fallen from an incredible level over the summer of about 144 per hundred weight and ended the year under $50 per hundred weight. That's about a 75, 72% loss in value within, you know, about a six week window. Now it has come up a little bit in the early weeks of 2024. We're back up around $55 per hundred weight, but it's been an interesting price to watch. And that's below the five-year average at this point. And we've been below the five-year average since about the end of October. So for the last, let's call it nine or 10 weeks or so, you've seen this price go from something that was enormously higher than the five-year average for most of 2023 to below the five-year average, anywhere from eight to 25% over the last, again, eight to 10 weeks or so. And this is coming at a time where supplies are generally tighter. If you look at November and December, fed cattle slaughter was down about 4% compared to 2022. And so this decline in price is happening when you also have decline in supplies. So what does that necessarily mean? Could we be seeing a little bit of weakness in the demand side? It is maybe a time of year where ground beef is a little less prevalent in consumer purchases because you had the holidays and then Generally speaking, early part of the year, we tend to see more activity on chucks and roasts. So now to contrast the 50% lean trimmings, if you look at the 90% lean trimmings, those have held together pretty well. Now they had, they did also see a pretty big decline heading into late last year, but they did not fall below the the five-year average. And so from a terms of reset type of value, 90% lean hasn't adjusted as much as the 50% on a percentage basis. It only fell about 12% from those summer highs to their lowest point of 2023. We're still sitting probably about close to 5% higher than the five-year average here, kicking off 2024 and reaching in last week's data, probably closer to 12% above the five-year average. And again, that 90% lean is not going to be the fed cattle market, right? It's going to be that cow market and the cow type beef moving into that chain. So they are different products, but it's interesting to look at kind of how those two markets are moving and, and look at them together because they are blended to make those ground beef products and get the lean to fat ratio that you want. So we are seeing less cow slaughter in general. And so that's feeding into that 90% lean, but we have seen quite a bit more imports coming in in the late part of 2023 as well. And so some of that is why you've seen some of that price decline. And on the topic of imports, trade numbers came out this week. Trade numbers came in for November. So we have only the first 11 months of 2023. And so far, beef exports year to date have totaled about 2.8 billion pounds, down 15% from the same period of 2022. Exports in terms of biggest losses, Japan down 21%, China down 22%, South Korea down 18%. So some fairly large declines. One of the bright spots has been Mexico, which is up still about 12% from a year ago. And again, those are the year-to-date numbers. Beef imports in November only were up 21%. So a big number in terms of beef imports coming in. And year-to-date beef imports through November totaled about 3.4 billion pounds, up 9% over 2022. And imports really have been higher across the board, 60% increase from Australia. So that's probably the largest one and a 33% increase from New Zealand. We've also seen a little bit higher volumes come in from Canada and Mexico. And a lot of that has to do with how much the U.S. is still willing to pay for beef. So although we talked about the cutout moving a little bit lower, those prices are still very good by historical standards. And the last thing that we're going to talk about today, Caitlin, is the LMIC has some pre-report estimates for the inventory numbers that we're expecting to see at the end of this month. So January 1 is the big opportunity for the cattle industry to see what type, how many cattle are out there and what by class, as well as the beef replacements on hand, dairy replacements on hand, and a lot of numbers that you don't get throughout the year. This is also one of the few times you get those numbers by state. The July 1 inventory report does not cover by state values. And so it could be really interesting to see where the industry is at. And, and it is a point in time in t- estimate. So it's only valid as of January 1. And as we know, these cattle can move around quite a bit, but it's still an important number nonetheless, and one that is usually fairly highly anticipated coming into the new year. Now, we've looked at cow slaughter. We've looked at what we think the calf crop is and done some math here. We're expecting the beef cow herd number to decrease 2.8% from a year ago. 
that seems to be, you know, where we kind of think things will be. Dairy cows are down about half a percent from a year ago. That's fairly in line with what the milk production report said in November. But the big questions are beef cow replacements and dairy cow replacements, because we don't really have a good proxy for those. And so some of that is a shot in the dark, if you will. But these are our best estimates. And we're expecting beef cow replacements to be down 2.7 percent. That's largely based on what we, we've seen in terms of cattle on feed and the large, large volumes of heifers that still continue to move through the beef supply chain as opposed to stay in the country and look towards the breeding herd. In terms of dairy cow replacements, we're expecting about a 1% decline. That's a pretty typical number in ratio to that dairy cow number, keying off that. And then the other one is the calf crop. What do we expect for the calf crop moving forward? And this too is a is a number that you're largely looking at kind of what historical relationships have been between how many beef cows you have, how many dairy cows you have, and what that usually generates for a calf crop. And so we're sitting at just over 3.3% decline in the calf crop in 2024. So you won't actually get that 2024 number in January. You will get the 2023 number. So we're just putting it out there as that's kind of what we're expecting. And, and you'll get a number there in July for that as a more of a, a better estimate. Caitlin, if people would like to see stuff from the Livestock Marketing Information Center, where can they do that? You can visit our website, which has been revamped if any of you haven't seen it yet. We relaunched a new website on December 12th, and you can find that at www.lmic.info. That was Director of the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Caitlin McCulloch. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our Monday show discussing cold weather concerns for cattle. And then to talk about it, we're joined by K-State veterinarian in the Diagnostic Lab in the College of Veterinary Medicine, Greg Hanselcheck. Greg, thanks for joining us today. Nice to be here. Greg, we've had some really cold weather and are expected to continue to be pretty chilly. And you get quite a few questions around this time in the lab. Yeah, when it gets as cold as it's going to be, then we get a, a lot of calls. And actually, the calls come in. Uh, because there's health issues already. And what we see when it gets this cold is, particularly in, in the herds that are calving, are uh, weak calves, sometimes stillborn, but typically weak calves. Uh, some producers will call them dummy calves, but it, it has an effect on these calves that are being born in the severe cold. And not only thinking about the calves, but this cold weather really has an impact on the mothers as well. It does. And what what's happening in the mother nutritionally does uh, go into the calf. And so just some numbers to think about when when it gets to 10 degrees the energy needs of a cow is about 20 percent more than than if it's higher than that and that's four to five pounds of hay basically when it gets to minus 10 they need 40 percent more energy and we're talking eight to 12 pounds more of hay so as it gets colder those cows need more energy just to maintain their body and, and, and if they're not maintained, then that is going to affect the calf. There's something else that's always important for cattle, but especially when it's this cold out. Yeah, so it's water. I mean, I know producers know the importance of, of water for these animals, but even cold, they're going to consume uh, many, many gallons. And uh, if they don't have access to water, we talked about how they're going to eat and want more hay. Well, if they don't have access to, to enough water, their, their consumption of that hay is not going to be what it should be. So, and, and water is the nutrient they need the most. So it's really important, if at all possible, that, that they have constant access to free choice water during these very, very uh, cold spells. And so as we're thinking about those calves, a really big concern when we talk about cold weather and those young animals, hypothermia. Hypothermia is a big deal. Once it gets below about 50 degrees, that's, that's the lowest temperature the calves thrive. But when we get down to 10 and below zero, uh, hypothermia is, is an, a big time issue with these beef calves that are out in open ground and, and uh, during the calving season. And something to think about with those calves is the thermal insulation factor. Yeah, it's kind of a neat number. It's, uh, it's based on uh, how much body fat. And these calves are born with only about 3 to 4% body fat. Uh, and it's based on body fat and then skin thickness. 
and and their their number, their thermal insulation number is 2.5. An adult cow is uh, 10 to 12. So it's you can see why we look at baby calves and we deal with hypothermia in them, and we really don't deal that much with it with the adult cow. You said sometimes farmers call them dummy calves, but what are some of those more clinical signs of hypothermia? Yeah, the the dummy calf is number one, and it's there's just calves that kind of wander around. They don't they they act like they don't even know where their dam is. They may not they may lose their suckle reflex, uh, but. There's other things people can use to decide whether a calf is hypothermic. You read where they say grab an ear or grab an extremity. If it's cold, uh, they're probably hypothermic. Well, i got to believe today if you went and grabbed a calf's ear, it's probably going to be cold. So the, really the, the only way to diagnose it that I know of is to take a rectal temperature. And if it's below 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you've got a diagnosis that this calf is hypothermic, and your treatment is to warm it up as, as fast as possible. And there are a few different ways that producers could warm up an animal. Yes, and it's, uh, there's only one well-done research uh, project to look at the best method to warm a calf, and it was done in, in Canada. And they, they looked at uh, a calf in a pen in a barn with a heat lamp over it, And they found that that was a very inefficient way to warm a calf. Uh, The best method that they found was uh, putting a calf into a a bathtub with extremely warm water. And and I don't know many cow-calf producers or ranchers that have a bathtub that they'd want to do that with. But the other thing they looked at were these hot boxes. And they're they're enclosed boxes that have either a heat lamp or more typically more like a little heater that's got a fan. Uh, and a thermo it needs a thermostat, and these that's the best method for for uh, warming up these calves. If you're going to use a hot box, I got to bring this up. It needs to have a thermostat because we have dealt with cases where the calves became hyperthermic, where they became overheated because the temperature in that little box got extremely hot. And then the other thing is, as those calves are in there, the air is going to be filled up with just normal bacteria. As they breathe and as they defecate and urinate, it's important to have a fan in there, some type of ventilation to pull the bad air out and force good air into the box. But um, you can make them at home. You can buy them online. They're a very, very effective way of warming up calves. If that's something they don't have, is tossing it possibly in their pickup, especially if they're out in a pasture, a great beginning to getting things warmed back up? Yep. Uh, I learned that from some really good ranchers in some very parts, cold parts of the country. And they, you know, they, they had pickups where they didn't have carpet in there, so they didn't mind them getting dirty. And they'd put them on the floorboard, put the heat on full blast. And, and uh, from what they tell me, and I believe them, you can warm up a calf very, very quickly that way also. We've talked about warming those calves up on the outside, but do we need to consider the inside of them as well? Absolutely. So you think about it, we're warming up the outside, but all the internal organs are hypothermic also. And so we've got to figure out a way to heat from the outside and the inside. And so there's a couple ways. It's just heat up some uh, an electrolyte solution or uh, make up some milk replacer. Make sure it's a good milk replacer, 20-20, protein-to-fat, milk-based, but heat it up to 101 to 105 degrees, both of those, and then give the calf that orally a couple times a day, two quarts at a time. Uh, if you're using the electrolyte solutions, they're very low in energy, and I I like to promote a, a tablespoon of Cairo syrup, the white syrup uh, that you can find in the grocery stores. That's the only source of uh, sugar that a calf can digest. It's a really good way of adding energy to these calves' uh, internal supplementations. It's really important to to give them something orally that's warm. Hoping to avoid having hypothermic calves, one way to do that is giving them a pretty warm place to stay. Yeah, I mean, there's not much you can do. Protect them from the wind, which producers already know that. But bedding is a big deal, and for both the cows and the calves, because it just it insulates them. And when they if they lay on cold ground, they're going to give their body heat to the ground. And if we've got a good insulation of, of straw out there, it's going to insulate them from the from the ground. And one of the ways that producers can uh, determine whether they have enough bedding out there is to they look at the calves that are that are laying there. We call it nesting. And when those calves are nesting in the in the straw, if they if they can see the legs of the calf, there's not enough bedding. If they can't see the legs of the of the calf, 
there's enough bedding for those calves to nest. They're going to stay warmer. They're going to be protected from the cold ground. And Greg, how fast have you seen a calf have issues with hypothermia after birth or even just being young? Well, it's it's amazing. Uh, just from being in practice and seeing this within just a half hour or so, you, a lot of times on a very, very cold night where the wind is blowing very, very hard, these calves will become hypothermic, even if their mother's licking them off. Uh, remember, they're coming out of an environment of nine months of about 101 degrees, and now we're putting them out when they're wet, and now we're talking about zero or 10 below. It, it doesn't take them long to, to become hypothermic. Throughout this interview, Greg, we've talked a lot about cattle, but this is really important for all farm livestock? Absolutely, yeah. We, we talk about cows and calves and things, but it's it's all like, it's horses. It's uh, I don't know anything about poultry, never had birds, but... But I'm guessing anything, any uh, any ruminant or uh, any any normal livestock animal is going to be uh, subjected to some severe hypothermia if possible. Greg, I appreciate you taking the time to join me today and share with us some cold weather concerns for livestock. My pleasure. That was Kansas State University veterinarian in the Diagnostic Lab in the College of Veterinary Medicine, Greg Hanselcheck. If you'd like to read more on this topic, you can do so from an article from the K-State Extension Beef Team. The article is titled, Preparing for Winter Weather Extremes. I will link it in today's show notes on agtoday.net, or you can also find it by going to KSU Beef. And also, as we've talked to Greg, he is a part of the Diagnostic Lab in the College of Veterinary Medicine here at Kansas State University. And so if you'd like to check out all the different testing that they can do, you can do that by going to ksvdl.org. That is ksvdl.org to find the Kansas State Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. And as we are having these weather conditions, I do just want to remind you about the tools available on the K-State Mesonet website, which you can find by going to mesonet.ksu.edu. Again, that is M-E-S-O-N-E-T dot K-S-U dot E-D-U. And on that website, you can find an animal comfort index tool. And to find it, you click on agriculture and then click on animal comfort. Not only does it have the current animal comfort index, conditions, but a newer tool available from the Mesonet is a forecast. It's a seven-day forecast of what conditions they're expecting and how it impacts animal comfort. I will link all of these resources in today's show notes, which as always, you can find on actday.net. We're cutting to a short break now on agriculture today, but stick around because when we come back, we have another segment of Faces in Agriculture. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we conclude our Monday show with another segment of Faces in Agriculture. And this time we're joined by an ag producer in Barton County, Melissa Nelson. Melissa, thanks for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. Melissa, can you tell us a little bit about your operation? Sure. So we are located in Barton County, and our operation is South Bend Industrial Hemp. We are traditional farmers in this area that have decided to diversify our farming operation to include industrial hemp for fiber production. We have also value added that chain and added a fiber processing facility here in Great Bend, where we contract with farmers throughout the state and really throughout the Midwest to bring fiber hemp into our facility. And from there, we process and then send that to manufacturers across the country. And as you've diversified and expanded the operation, what have been some of your biggest challenges? Really the lack of knowledge around industrial hemp. People do not really associate or can differentiate the difference between cannabis in the form of marijuana and then cannabis in the form of industrial hemp. And then within industrial hemp, you have cannabinoid production, which is your flowers and CBD which is kind of the hot topic that everybody knows a lot about. But there is this whole industry of fiber and grain production, which is very much like traditional agriculture. So a lot of people don't realize the production that we are doing here is for animal bedding, is for insulation, bioplastics, ropes. A lot of these very, quote unquote, normal items that people are using in their everyday life can be either supplemented or replaced with a hemp product. 
And you really created a whole facility for helping a lot of producers across Kansas if they choose to grow this? Yes. And so we have a growers meeting. We provide agronomic support. We provide everything from seed to the final sale to us. Because at the end of the day, we are farmers first, and we understand that farmers are really the lifeblood of Kansas, and really agriculture is the lifeblood of of the U.S. in general and people. And so making sure our farmers have a successful season is the utmost important to us. What other important things have you done for your operation to be successful? Being genuine. Uh, We've been slowly growing our social media platform. Again, just very focused on education and awareness about this really unknown crop uh, because it is so new, particularly here in Kansas um, in terms of legalization. But being genuine, uh, letting people see that we are very involved within our community. You know, there's no smoke and mirror shows. Industrial hemp for fiber production is here to stay in Kansas and it can be successful. And you mentioned you guys were more traditional production agriculture farmers and use this as a way of diversification. And so if someone else is thinking that this might be a path for them or wanting to diversify somewhere else, what would you recommend for them? What advice would you give them? Go find somebody reputable that you can sell your product to. One of the things that's very important for industrial hemp is that you have that contract with the processor prior to putting any seed in the ground. Because this isn't like corn. You know, you grow a corn crop, it can go to the ethanol plant, it can go to the feed yard, it can go to the elevator. You have options to figure out throughout the season. For industrial hemp for fiber production, I need our farmers to grow it a specific way because our manufacturers are asking for it to be done a specific way. And as it comes into our processing facility, at the end of the day, it all starts with the farmer and how they put that seed in the ground. And so you really have to be thinking with the end in mind. So if you're looking to get into this, find somebody that you trust, find somebody to get you a contract and and that you feel comfortable working with. And as we look forward in agriculture, Melissa, what makes you excited? Opportunities. Um, I really think, and particularly as a young farmer, you know, my husband, my brother-in-law, they're my partners in South Bend Industrial Hemp, there's a lot of opportunity for the young farmers if they're willing to take that risk and willing to work hard. There's a lot of farmers that are looking to retire or age out of farming. And so if you set yourself up for success and you set yourself up with good farming, sustainable practices, you'll be able to capitalize on those opportunities. And if someone would like to learn more about South Bend Industrial Hemp, how can they do that? Sure. You can go to our website, southbendindustrialhemp.com, and that's going to take you to all our social media links. If you're active on Facebook, it's South Bend Industrial Hemp. Instagram is South Bend Hemp, or you can find me on LinkedIn under Melissa Nelson. That was Melissa Nelson from South Bend Industrial Hemp. In today's show notes, I will put links if you'd like to learn more about their operation. That's all we have for you today on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you tomorrow. Tomorrow.